lost habitat boundaries and assessing how that interdependence between systems changes with anthropogenic influence both locally and globally as a result for example of habitat loss and climate change in all of this dr tally seeks to integrate education and applied conservation biology into his fundamental research questions you will note that uh, both of our speakers today are from the sciences which again uh, confirms and affirms how important the voices of scientists are within our programming at the Humanities Centre. It's very important for us. Uh, I should also mention uh, that both of our speakers today interrupted their hard-won sabbaticals to be with us this afternoon, and that, I think, <laughs> makes them worthy of an especially warm welcome. So, with that thought in mind, please welcome Professors Kate Boersma and Drew Tallon. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing these series. Um, I think this is the third or fourth one I've done and um, I'm trying something new this time. So I understand, I think I finally get the purpose of these Humanity Center series. And typically I come in and I give my usual science talk with all the graphs and whatnot. And today I am trying to be a little more synthetic and embracing the theme, um, even though I couldn't come to all of the other awesome talks that have been in this, I've been in Mexico. Um, so today, uh, because of that, um, I'm a little out of my comfort zone here today. There are gonna be some parts of this talk that are well in my comfort zone and you're gonna know, cause I'm gonna be like, and they're gonna be pictures of bugs and I'll dance around. Um, but I'm trying to push myself. I'm, I really use this. I did a lot of research, I'm on sabbatical. So I've been thinking about wilderness and uh, taking advantage of this as a motivation for sort of thinking through some concepts that I've been trying to, and some changes I might wanna make in my research program. So thank you, your invitation has inspired me to do some thinking. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about desert wilderness and desert wilderness. The difference being the capital, uh, where, where? yeah, does this not show up on the screen? Oh, wah wah. Okay. Okay. I, I, <laughs> what? Wrong. <laughs> what century are we in? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I also don't usually use an outline, but the talk kind of jumps around. So I'd like to be able to come back and reference it. We're going to start out with the concept of wilderness. This is the part that Mark should be doing. Um, and I actually have a quote from Mark in this section because um, we discussed some of this on email. And then we're going to transition into my research program, which happens on wilderness lands. And then we're going to circle back and try and integrate the two. And I'll tell you how confused I am about how to do that. All right, so let's start with uh, wilderness. The word wilderness first appeared in print um, in the 1200s. And um, the meaning of wilderness remained pretty much the same through the early conquest of North America. Uh, and so for this entire time period, these centuries, uh, wilderness was something to be conquered. It was something to be feared. Um, and this was a way to separate man from nature. That was the point. Um, and then at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s, there started to be a shift in how people view wilderness. And that happened, um, well, following the Industrial Revolution, of course, but during the World Wars, um, automobiles became more commonplace and national parks already existed. Um, so there were protected lands in the US, um, but those protected lands um, were becoming more and more visited by the public. And a lot of that was automobile visitation. And so partly in response to that, um, the founders of the Wilderness Society started talking up these other facets of wilderness. Things like nature as pristine, untouched, and pure. Think Aldo Leopold. To those devoid of imagination, a blank place on the map is a useless waste. To others, the most valuable part. And some people went so far as to say that uh, wilderness is a manifestation of God. One of those is John Muir. Uh, in God's wildness lays, lies the hope of the world, the great, fresh, unblighted, unredeemed wilderness. The galling harness of civilization drops off and wounds heal ere we are. So this is quite a shift that happened here. <laughs> it was great, excellent rebranding. 
that was done. And these guys knew what they were doing um, because then it was conceived as a land designation, wilderness, we're moving from lowercase w wilderness to capital W wilderness. It was conceived by this, some of those names, the founders of the Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society. Uh, the idea came up in 1948 and it, they took it to Congress and it was pushed and finally became the Wilderness Act in 1964. So the Wilderness Act says, a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape, is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. That word untrammeled is important. Um, it's a very eloquently written act. It also says it's an area of undeveloped federal land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or human habitation. You might start to see what's missing here. So um, after this was ratified, uh, the wilderness designation could then be added on top of other public land designations. If you have a national park, you can make a part of your national park into a wilderness. If you have a national forest, you can add it on top. So it's additional protection on top of some other already protected category. And that provides, um, it restricts commercial enterprises, prohibits resource extraction, no roads, no motorized travel or other forms of mechanical transport. Because again, this was in response to the baby boom and the proliferation of automobiles in our national parks. Really, that was what spurred this. Um, and no people. And um, so this entire both lowercase w wilderness and capital W wilderness are based on the definition of wilderness as unoccupied and separate from man. And so of course this whole concept denies the presence of people before European colonization. <laughs> there were people there, it wasn't uninhabited. Um, it, in, it ignores what we have come to understand are a wealth of very important land management practices that have since ceased, and now we're trying to beg for assistance in remembering them now, right? And so th those are not included, not even considered in these definitions of wilderness. And at the time of the ratification, um, it ignored the current residents of the lands that were to be designated as wilderness. These were occupied even at the time of ratification. And an example of this, um, how bizarre this definition was, um, we know Ansel Adams, he was really important at sort of propagating this idea into the popular culture of America. Um, for several of his most famous photos, he asked native inhabitants to move out of the frame. I know, <laughs> I was like, what? Um, yeah, I learned a lot writing this talk. Um, <laughs> So also, uh, if we think back on those, uh, the founders of wilderness, many of them were very flawed individuals. This is a quote from John Muir. Um, it's hard to read. Uh, Strangely dirty and irregular life, these dark eyed, dark haired, half happy savages lead in this clean wilderness. Um, others were eugenicists, right? Um, so this idea of wilderness is a very particular kind of wilderness. And so what that meant is that indigenous people were forcibly removed um, following wilderness designation. This happened more with the um, formation of national parks, which had happened several decades earlier. Um, it's in most of our big name national parks, um, indigenous communities were forcibly uh, removed. And in some cases then asked to be rehired and pretend to be Native Americans by the park service. Mm -hmm. Um, but not only that, but they were not allowed, and in some cases are still not allowed, to access ancestral lands for ceremony and harvest. Now this is changing, but it's still on a park-by-park -park basis, and it depends on if it's a wilderness area in a national forest or a wilderness area in a state park, right? And so there is no blanket permission, even though um, that was guaranteed to the tribes when they agreed to um, give their land and make it either national forest or national park in the first place. And so for me, um, this is these are pretty dirty roots, right? And so here I am as a nature lover, 
an aquatic ecologist, all those things that Brian read off my completely outdated website that I should revise. Um, is there a value in this? Because I look at today, 5% of the United States is wilderness. It's protected from roads. That's huge. Over 110 million acres, over half of our national parks are protected. 22% of national forest land. These are, you can't build there. You can't even use a chainsaw there, right? The people who are doing trail maintenance have to carry in hand saws. This is, this is a powerful degree of protection that came from a very flawed initial concept. And so um, in preparation for this, we were all emailing and um, Mark, I had asked him a few questions and uh, he wrote this really insightful response um, when I told him what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna read his book. I couldn't get it before this talk, um, Rethinking Wilderness 2017. You should also read it. So this is a big quote from Mark, but I think it's really um, important. The old story that most of what is now North America was in a wilderness condition, largely without people, as in Nash's wilderness in the American mind, clearly denied the presence of millions of people. But the new story that what is now North America was thoroughly humanized and managed by people also goes too far, and that it denies the presence of an other than human world and misconstrues the relationships of indigenous people to their ancestral lands. The adjective untrammeled and the original Wilderness Act is crucial to help see this. To trammel something is to fetter, hamper, confine, impede, restrain, shackle, or dominate it. To trammel something is to deny the possibility of having a participatory relationship with it. In this sense, much of what is now North America was untrammeled prior to the arrival of European and later Euro-American peoples. It is these peoples who trammeled landscapes, killed indigenous peoples, imposed cultural genocide, and practiced settler colonialism. So I really appreciated his take, makes me excited to read his book and sad that he cannot be here to tell me all the things I'm getting wrong. Um, so hopefully, I'm looking forward, we're gonna have coffee after he comes back. Um, so this is, he found a happy medium, I guess. He found the value in the critique. And in this book, he goes through six other critiques to wilderness. This is just one of the many criticisms. In the end, I see current wilderness preservation as a temporary protection measure against non-Indigenous peoples to provide for refugia, for natural wilds, and free other than human nature. All right, let's transition to our region. This map here shows, here's the Salton Sea, here's San Diego. Um, this map shows all of the wilderness areas in Southern California. We have San Diego County ends here. So San Diego County is from here this way. We have 85,000 acres of wilderness. And if we count all of the desert wilderness, that's all the yellow ones, that's over 1.5 million acres of desert wilderness. So we are fortunate to have access for recreation. This isn't off limits to people. This is off limits to vehicles. It's beautiful places to access. And so that brings me to my research program, because the reason I do what I do is because I get to play and work in these beautiful places to access. So there's gonna be a, sh a sort of stark transition here, but then we'll circle back at the end. Um, I study water in the desert um, and have for 15 years now. And uh, basically that means my work is guided by the following topics, right? First, just trying to document aquatic biodiversity here in the Colorado desert. It's really understudied. Um, secondly, um, my students and I are documenting the effects of increasing fragmentation of streams and rivers. And I'll give you some examples of fragmentation here in a sec. And finally, we're looking at the adaptations that aquatic organisms have to be able to survive in a stream in a desert. So what do desert streams and rivers look like? Well, for parts of the year, they look like streams and rivers everywhere else. I took this photo on Friday. This is in Friso Gorge um, Wilderness Area. Sabbatical. I know y'all were teaching on Friday. <laughs> no, you weren't because it was a holiday, right? Okay, never mind. Well, you could have joined me. Um, so this is a stream that um, 
I come to this place regularly. I haven't seen it flow in six years. And it is, but it looks like it's meant to be there, right? Um, these streams that are only here for portions of the year or only here every couple of years, these are called intermittent streams. And here's another one. This is Maiden Hair Falls. These are all in Anza Borrego Desert State Park um, and the wilderness areas within that state park. Um, this is the hike out of Hellhole Canyon. Um, this does not flow every year, but it flows almost every year, as opposed to this previous one that flows every five or 10 years. So we have different degrees of harshness, different degrees of difficulty to live in this stream if you're an aquatic herd. Here's another example. This is Coyote Creek. It's the uh, super bloom that they don't want to call super bloom. It's gorgeous. Um, but this gets flow probably every other year. And sometimes the creeks that don't dry completely, they'll fragment. So these little like bathtub sized pools and all of those aquatic organisms that are spread throughout the creek or river um, get condensed into these little pools and they end up like refuges and they hang out there until it rains again and then they swim out and take over the whole creek again. So what can survive in those crazy harsh conditions? Mostly aquatic invertebrates. We do have a few desert fishes that I also study, um, but they're pretty rare uh, and mostly I'm talking about these organisms because they have amazing adaptations. They have evolved to tolerate streams that dry. So how do they do that? Well, I'm gonna talk just about a few um, adaptations that they have that are super cool, and then describe one particular study that's in one of the wilderness areas in Anza Borrego and how these particular um, invertebrates are able to survive there. Okay, so adaptation number one I want to talk about is called emergence timing. So some aquatic invertebrates live in water their whole lives. Like uh, these are diving beetles. That's a giant water bug, also called a toe biter. That's a water strider. Um, but then some aquatic insects or aquatic invertebrates only spend a part of their lives in the water. And then they emerge and fly away. This is a damselfly. Oops, oh my God a dragonfly, and a mayfly. So we'll probably recognize them when they're adults, but as larvae, they actually spend most of their life cycle in the water. And so this means that they can synchronize the timing of their emergence to coincide with the dry season. So they get out of the creek before it dries. And so you see this for almost all of these types of desert aquatic taxa. Here's an example. Um, these are black flies. Yeah, like the black flies you know, the ones that bite you. Um, they are all, so here's a little black fly. They're kind of like bowling pin shaped and the, end, the tip of the bowling pin is attached to a rock and then the mouth parts are up at the top and they're hanging out in these big groups. And those mouth parts are feeding. They're catching food from the current. So these are modified mouth parts, these things that look like eyelashes. And so they'll just hang out there and sway back and forth and the water brings them detritus that they catch in those mouth parts and then, you know, consume. Um, which is a really cool adaptation if you live in a flowing water system. It does not work when your stream fragments to small bathtubs because there's no flow that's gonna bring you your dinner. And so, this is one of those organisms that has very carefully synchronized emergence timing based on the hydro period or the duration of water at each of these sites. So at some sites we'll find this emergence time, at other sites we'll find this emergence time, and it's based on those local flow regimes. Another cool adaptation that organisms in our region need to have is diapause. Diapause is kind of like um, hibernation except for insects. It's think about pausing your life history strategy. Um, one example that we have here are stoneflies. Uh, this is a winter stonefly in the family Capneidae. And these are able to crawl meters below the surface. So some things diapause as eggs, like the adult will lay eggs, the eggs dry up, and then the water comes back and the eggs are like, think um, like sea monkeys, right? There are a lot of organisms that do that. These are actually diapausing as larvae. So there are bugs about this big. And so they're crawling down all the way to reach the water table. And then they'll show up within a couple of days of flow resumption once the rains happen. 
Another amazing diapause adaptation is in the biting midge. These are surrounded by going a day. And um, <laughs> this guy, Stanley Dodson, he had some on a Petri dish on his lab counter and he just forgot about them and went home for the weekends. And he came back and they were dried up and crusty. Don't do this, um, it's not very ethical. Um, and when he rehydrated it, the midges just sprung back to life. I mean, that's amazing adaptation for this kind of environment. And the last adaptation that's really important here is aerial dispersal. All of these organisms are able to fly from one habitat to another. So when I say that they're aquatic for their entire life cycle, that's true, but those beetles are able to get up, fly away and land somewhere else if their habitat dries. They require water, but they can leave it for short periods of time. Okay, so the motivation for my research is basically that with climate change, droughts are hotter, longer, and more frequent. Rain events are less predictable and more violent. So we have a lot of rain falling in a short period of time. And that's problematic for aquatic organisms that have synchronized life histories that rely on timing that is predictable. That's what, those are those cycles they've evolved to. And so, my questions are, um, what's gonna happen? Will these adaptations, these amazing adaptations, will they allow the invertebrates to tolerate these new, more extreme conditions? Will these same adaptations be enough? Because some folks think that desert aquatic taxa are really hardy, and so they're gonna be fine. Um, but we don't know that. And so that's what my research program is trying to address. So, um, we're going to talk here about this one particular site um, on wilderness lands in Anza Borrego Desert State Park called Sentinac Cienega. This is a recent project because it sort of exemplifies some of the, the good things about my research program, some of the problematic things about my research program, and it involves a lot of, um, oops, check the HDMI cable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, these are a number of undergraduate students who contributed, um, Taryn and Janelle. Uh, they just presented their capstone research two weeks ago, and, and my student Ozzy is presenting on May 1st at 1220 p.m. and Charlie 242. 232, um, you should come, it's gonna be amazing. So they all work with me on this, um, this desert wetland. The desert wetlands, as you might assume, are very rare and threatened by climate change. So here's where we're located, San Diego, the Salton Sea. We're gonna dive into that X. And so here we zoomed in a little bit. Here's the town of Julian. The Salton Sea is up here. San Diego's over there, Lake Henshaw. And so if we zoom in more, this is San Felipe Creek. It's an intermittent creek. So back in the Pleistocene, it used to flow all the way out to the Salton Sea. It doesn't do that anymore. Um, but what it does is it has a few parts up here that do flow, and then it has a lot of parts that are intermittent that dry for portions of the year. And right in the middle is Sentinac Cienega, this imperiled wetland. So now we're zooming in even more. Um, here's our Sienega, um, our wetlands. And this is Scissors Crossing. How many of you heard of Scissors Crossing? Okay, I'm always curious. Um, Scissors Crossing is the intersection of the 78 and S2. Um, if you hang out in the desert, you have to drive through it a lot. There's a little bridge there. Um, and you probably did not notice the uh, Sienega, um, but lots of other folks have before you. Um, it has been inhabited for over 4,000 years, but probably that's just the like village site data we have. Um, all evidence from the region suggests that it's closer to 10 or 12,000. Um, these were um, all three groups of Kumeyaay had villages there, and there's also evidence of Cupeño and Calvilla presence. Um, then in 1834, colonizing ranchers entered, and by the 1840s, the last indigenous residents had been kicked out. Fast forward to 1998, it was purchased by Anza Borrego, the livestock were removed, and it was designated as a wilderness area. 
Then in 2018, I got money for the project that I'm about to tell you about. So this is a very important migration corridor. Um, it runs north-south uh, and it separates the, the lagunas from the desert. And so it's this little ribbon of greener habitats with access to a whole range of places. And so for humans, it's been an important migration corridor for thousands of years. I already mentioned that the tribes, the missionaries came through here. The Southern Emigrant Trail runs right through this valley and the Butterfield Stagecoach routes. The Pacific Crest Trail runs right through this valley. <clears throat> Migrants and refugees are commonly going through this valley and the intersection of Highway 78 and S2. So you may have driven through this valley. So this has been a key route of human movements for thousands of years. It's also, not surprisingly, used by non-humans. There's 72 species of migratory birds in this area. And then I set up trail cams and found a whole bunch of larger and more charismatic megafauna working at my field sites, including those sapses and several mountain lions. There are hundreds of mountain lion sites, sightings at my, uh, my location, which my regrets don't really think is as cool as my deal. <laughs> <laughs> so why was there funding for this project? Well, Sunflower Sienega is undergoing catastrophic drought. Um, this is an overhead view satellite image from 1992. You'll notice here um, this bright green. And that bright green represents the native wetland plants. Um, and then through time in 2005, you'll see that that bright green color has shrunk somewhat. Well, a lot. Um, that's 2014 and here's 2018. And so we don't have any of that bright green left. And so those wetland plants require some level of predictability. There was water year round, it was damp. Um, your feet would get wet when you walked through there, even if you went in the middle of summer. And about two decades ago, that started to change. And it started to change disproportionately to other very rare wetlands in the region. And so the Park Service didn't know why, and so they wanted to figure it out. Uh, so this, the, the proposal was the Sensenex Yenega Ecosystem Restoration Plan. It was this big collaboration with me, the UCI, State Parks, Cal Fish and Game, and we submitted this proposal in 2017, got the money in 2018, and then started collecting data. This has supported my student research program here at USC from 2018 to 2023. So I'm very grateful for this, and so are a whole gaggle of students, and we'll come back to this point a little bit later. So what exactly were we doing there? Well, we were sampling aquatic insects in the places that there were water. I told you that there were sites upstream that had water year round, the perennial sites, and then sites downstream that were dry for portions of the year. These look more like big bedrock bathtubs. And so the reason this was important is because we were trying to figure out the, the points to restore the cyanida. Um, like, can we bring water back? There are some techniques that you might be able to bring water to the surface, so we're considering some of those. But I wanted to look at both the perennial sites, because this is the historic, the assumed historic condition, the reference of what the Sensenac Sienega um, communities used to look like, and then the intermittent reaches seem like a more reliable future scenario, but no one knew anything about what lived there. So um, upstream, uh, it is a beautifully green perennial habitat with stable year-round flow. It comes up from spring, uh, dense cottonwood and willow canopy, high macrophyte density and diversity. Macrophytes are just aquatic plants with part of the plant underwater and part of the plant exposed. And there's very cold, highly oxygenated water. This is excellent habitat for bugs. So we sampled it. Downstream was a little bit different. Um, this is one of those bedrock pools I talked about. This is about a meter deep, but it pretty much dries every year. Um, there's variable flow during winter. This year, we had flow for at least a couple of weeks, um, but typically it fragments to open bedrock pools, so there's no flow anymore. Really high temperature variability, and it's super, super salty. So over 5,000 microstemons per centimeter for reference, the other site was about 600. So if you're an invertebrate, that change, <laughs> that's hard for you to manage um, physiologically. 
So it'll limit what kinds of organisms you have there. So there was some greenery downstream. Here are a few remaining cottonwoods. Most of the cottonwoods have died out, but mostly we have like mesquite and other uh, desert shrubs. So we went out and sampled aquatic invertebrates in these places. Uh, January, March, and June of 2019 to 2022. Um, I had a gaggle of wonderful undergrads who would come to the field with me, then would, um, we would collect the samples in the field using those DNets, preserve them in ethanol, take them back. Students would do the identification and cataloging. We had some quality control of the identifications, and then the samples get preserved in the Natural History Museum when we're done with them. I love this slide. This is um, Janelle and Taryn doing stats. <laughs> um, so then we use those data to um, basically assess the biodiversity. What, how diverse is this habitat? How did the upstream and downstream compare? Is it even worth caring about the downstream habitats? All right, so in total, we had 119 samples. So a sample is one of these jars full of bugs. Um, and that was over, well, it was almost 60,000 invertebrates that we identified from 131 taxa, 131 species. And so the next logical question, of course, is who are these species? How are they distributed upstream and downstream? And why do we care? Like, why does it matter? Well, not surprisingly, where there's more water, there are more aquatic insects. So there were many more aquatic insects in the place where there was permanent flow than in the place that dried sometimes. So an average per bottle, 22 species versus nine species. In the upstream samples, there were a lot of detritivores because they were breaking down all those leaves and sticks and dead organic material that had fallen in from that beautiful cottonwood willow canopy. Those are things like amphipods, a bunch of really adorable little caddis flies, and the filter feeders like our friend the black fly because there's reliable flowing water year round. Generally, we found a lot more sensitive species that lived here that could not tolerate the conditions downstream. Okay, so that was not really surprising. I mean, it was really cool, but it's not super surprising because it's a gorgeous habitat. Who wouldn't want to live there? Um, the surprise was that the downstream sample, well, let me, let me, before I show that, we expected the downstream samples to be a subset of the upstream. Right, like we thought it would just be all the same upstream bugs, but just the tough ones, right? Just the tolerant taxa is what we would find downstream. Instead, we found different taxa. So they weren't a small subset of that big group of species that was present upstream. They were critters that are rare in the region and were inhabiting these drying bathtubs of water. And that's because they're intermittent stream specialists with these adaptations to drying. So things like diapause, we did indeed find Capnura winter stoneflies. We found these great or Hermes fish flies that can do something similar. They're like this long, squirmy, students don't like to hold them either. Um, and they will come back um, within a day or two of flow resumption at this size. So you know that they were down there as, as invertebrate larvae. Um, we're seeing also other taxa, not surprisingly, that have long distance dispersal capacities. They can fly far away. A lot of predaceous diving beetles and water boatmen and back swimmers. So we also found some that just had a preference for non-flowing water. I know nobody likes uh, mosquitoes, but mosquito diversity is really important for the bats and birds in the area. And it was a high mosquito diversity in those downstream and we're the big beetles that prefer well, um, still water in those pools. So this is the summary that I gave the parsers, right? So they had hired me to do this portion of this project. Um, we said that there were different bugs. Um, the upstream is a refuge for the biodiversity that's probably been lost throughout the rest of the region. Um, but both of these reaches had unique biodiversity. They both hold conservation value. And additionally, although I didn't show this, that that channel downstream is a really important dispersal corridor for those, those flying, like long distance flying taxa that we see that are rare in the rest of the region. Okay, so we don't need to go into the recommendations. The point is that I want you to know that there were recommendations that were made for policy that emerged from this document. This was a 
California state report, things like more sampling and include the downstream parts in the restoration and minimize the impacts of the road, right? These like policy implications of this research. So now I want to go back to the reflection part. Obviously, I get real excited about the study and the bugs and these beautiful ecosystems. Um, and so here's that timeline that I showed you before. Um, we're submitting the final report in June 2023. This is a lot of what I worked on when I was in Mexico. Um, and the first tribal meeting we held on October of 2021. Goals submitted 2017. Funding received 2018. We designed our entire methodology. Data collection began 2018. And we didn't meet with the tribes until 2021. This is my first um, proposal that I have for the, for the state government that I've seen from beginning to end, right? I saw the entire funding cycle to completion. Um, and this pained me. It did not seem right. And in fact, yesterday I went to a climate change symposium and this guy, Tino Villaluz commented on this phenomenon. We are seldom brought into the process at the beginning of a project. The institutions teach that indigenous interactions are procedural, they're looking for a procedural checkbox. Um, I don't think there's anyone from the state park here, I hope not. Um, <laughs> we've had these conversations, but just sort of in passing. And so it's, I'm a cog in this wheel, but I'm a very concerned cog. And so that brings up some complex and questions about my research program. So basically my entire research program is based on the settler colonialist framework of conservation and management. Really a settler colonialist framework of science. And all my work is on federal and state protected areas. All my funding so far since I started at USD has come from this, these land management agencies. My research courses are taught here. All of my student research experiences take place on these lands. My research productivity, I got tenure because of work I was doing on indigenous lands and my reputation, right? Like the people know me, not lots of people, but the people who know me, know me for this work, right? And so what do I do with that? This history of wilderness, this history of the national parks and not including indigenous perspectives until you're writing up the reports for your grant. Um, so my personal perspective is that federal and state land is where we need to start with land back. That this is land return to the tribes. Um, there are a lot of indigenous scholars, I didn't make that up. There are a lot of indigenous scholars who think that that's a great place to start as well. Um, we can still allow for public access. Um, there are a lot of steps to get here though. Um, and here I am in the meantime, well, there's a great goal, right? And you hear this a lot with these land back programs. What do we do in the meantime? Can I keep my research program going with a good conscience? Um, even though we're not incorporating the native inhabitants of the land? The other question that I've been bringing up lately is about the necessity of invertebrate sacrifice. I don't really go into this part, but you can't identify these in the field. We kill them. We go out to the fields and all 119 of those jars were filled with dead bugs. Now, the nice thing about invertebrates is that they reproduce a lot. These dead bugs didn't make a dent in the population. Anything that was endangered or threatened left in the field. Um, but this is concerning. And what, what value is this? Um, I've started to reduce the number of samples I'm taking. Um, but I also teach statistics, and now that you have fewer samples, that affects a lot of things in science. <laughs> um, but I've also started to look to some indigenous led labs in Canada in particular. There are several that are really great examples of how to do animal sacrifice in a respectful way. Most of them are collaborating with indigenous people, um, which obviously I am not. Um, so basically, the whole summary of this talk. My inner conflict is what are my responsibilities as a biologist and an educator on someone else's land, right? I would cry if I could, if I didn't, like these experiences for the students are so valuable, but 
I'm not sure I feel good about it. And so there is a story of my complex. Um, thank you for listening. Um, here are a bunch of folks I need to thank. Um, these are my state parks people uh, and uh, more students. And uh, these are my, my teachers. Uh, the only the only two of these would actually recognize me in Atlanta, right? Mike and Percy. But <laughs> these are the folks I've been reading and listening to interviews and following to try and educate myself as a white lady on stolen land, right? Like, how do we learn about this as a scientist? Like, I wasn't taught about this stuff. And so I hope to continue learning. And I really hope that my fellow scientists in the room who are struggling with these same issues that we can really start having conversations about what this would look like in practice to apply this discomfort to something productive. All right, thanks. All right. All right, so, um, hi, I'm Drew. Um, just to start off, I wanted to say that I created my, my whole slide deck in a different application that didn't work in here. So some things will be a little funky looking with fonts changed and stuff like that. I was telling Brian that when, you're, when your talk is all style over substance, it pains me to see my style get uh, hurt here. But I'm gonna talk about sort of an oceanographer's perspective on the deserts. So the general thing, I'm gonna talk about sort of maybe a bit of framework, but just sort of my background and what brings me into working in deserts. Give a couple of examples and then finish off with a bit of a summary. All right, so let me begin by talking about, what am I even doing in deserts? What does that have to do with anything? Um, and to really talk about that, I want to talk about my two big mentors, the people who introduced me to desert research, because despite growing up here in San Diego, as a kid, I just didn't, the desert, I associated the desert with people who go off-roading and, and, I don't know, drink beer, so I was like, yeah, that doesn't sound like what I want to do. Um, so let me start by talking about Paul. So... Paul Dayton is, for those of you who don't know him, an incredibly famous oceanographer. Um, he's, I just looked it up, so he's, he's won a bunch of awards, the Margulif Award, all these other like prestigious awards. Mostly has done his research in rocky shores, uh, kelp forests, and the Antarctic. Um, more than 300 publications. Um, to me, that seems like an incredible number. To, to talk about that a little bit more, I say he was cited more than 36,000 times. I believe that there's 36,000 papers that cited his work. I looked it up in Google Scholar. This year, so far, he's been cited like 350 times already. Um, so, right, a guy who is steeped in marine science. Um, but, you know, Paul grew up uh, actually moving, uh, his family moved, his dad was a logger. So he moved in, lived in logging camps as a kid. Um, he did spend a lot of time um, in, actually his mom just loved uh, the desert. And so he spent a lot of time, this is him in his younger days at Puerto Penasco, the, the northern part of the Gulf. Um, he did a lot of work in the Antarctic. This picture, which I love, is of him in the Antarctic back in, I think, 67, something like that. Um, and that one looks much more like the Paul that those of us who know him would know. Um, but Paul spent a lot of time, this is the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve. Um, Paul spent a lot of time taking me there as a graduate student 
and trying to instill in me his love of the desert and just an understanding of the ecology and natural history there. Um, to go on to Gary, um, Gary was sort of the opposite of Paul. He was someone who was basically a desert ecologist who was kind of passionate about the ocean. Um, he did a lot of work on scorpions. He wrote this book called The Biology of Scorpions, which is sort of considered the Bible for scorpion people. I don't have a ton of pictures of Gary. He was my postdoc advisor um, who died in a research accident just a few months after I joined the lab. So I didn't get to spend a bunch of time with him. But boy, have I learned from him. And boy, have I, I managed to sort of inherit his research project. So I've been continuing his sampling in the desert since 2000. So every year, except for one. COVID. Um, I've managed to make it down there and keep those data going. All right, so those are the two people who really got me engaged in it. And so I was like, oh, this Brian invited me to give this talk. Well, what a great opportunity. I'm going to talk about some key concepts and how oceanography and the desert overlap with each other. So I made this big list and was reading up on it. And then I contacted Paul Dayton and I was like, hey, Paul, what do you think? You know, do you think I should emphasize this concept or that concept? And he was like, just get rid of the concepts. You don't need to talk about that. I said, no one's going to remember that. Just show them. Tell them a couple of cool stories about the desert. And that's going to stick with people a lot better than talking about some sort of, you know, formula that works both in deserts and in the ocean. So that's what I'm going to do today with you guys. I'm going to just give a couple of quick not even really stories, just talk a little bit about a couple of things that I think are really fascinating in the desert. And the examples, um, I'm going to talk about scorpions a little, and I'm going to talk about some small mammals that live in the desert that I've done some work on. So let me start with scorpions. Before I begin, uh, let me warn you that I am a bit of a dilettante here. Um, put up the definition of dilettante someone who seems to be interested, but whose understanding is not very deep or serious. And then I saw this one, superficial and affected dabbler. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds like my tombstone right there. <laughs> so uh, be prepared. Don't ask tough questions, basically, is what I'm saying. All right, talking about scorpions a little bit. Um, they are, I mean, they're one of those things that I think if you walk around in the desert, during the daytime, you're not going to see one. You might not know there even are scorpions out there. And yet, they can be in incredibly high densities. They, um, Behuvius literalis, this intertidal scorpion that lives like right in the desert shore, it can be as high as 12 for every square meter. So if you can imagine that, just like, you know, basically a yard by a yard, and in there there's 12 scorpions. So they can be in phenomenally high densities. Um, there are 70 species in North America. I'm not sure if that's a lot or a little, but contrary to what you might think about them, of those species, only one in North America is lethal. Now, any of them can be kind of like a bee if you're allergic to them, but in general, there's only one, the Arizona bark scorpion that uh, is known to be lethal. It actually occurs in Baja, and yet the ones in Baja, California, do not have the same level of venom. Um, so I suspect that might be like a tricky one where it's a different, slightly different species, but who knows. Um, what else do I want to say about them? Oh yeah, they, they give live birth. I'll show you an example of that, which is super cool. Um, they don't feed very often, right? They have this incredibly slow metabolism so they spend all day just underground chilling um, as best you can in the desert. And then at night, they generally don't move around a ton. They're just waiting for things to come close enough for them to eat them. So they feed, some of the species feed as few as like five times a year and others as many as 50, but even 50 is not that much, right? Um, let's see. There are some areas of the desert, I would point out, where their biomass exceeds any other animal in the desert, except for termites and ants. So 
there can be a substantial amount there. We know not very much, and it wasn't until pretty recently we started learning about their behavior and natural history. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a second because they're, they glow in the dark. I know some of you in here have definitely been to the desert and shined a black light on them. Well, that's sort of part of the story of why we never knew much about them. So let me talk about that for a second. Even in 2000, when I first started doing research with Gary, this is how we would go and find them out in the desert. You would take a motorcycle battery that you would have to, you know, it's a like, I don't know, 10 pound battery you had strapped over your shoulder. And then you would have a two to three foot long glass tube that was a black light. And that was how you had to wander around in the desert with that gear trying to find scorpions. And it was super cool because when you turn on the black light, the scorpions glow. They honestly look kind of like little plastic toys or something. But it wasn't until people didn't figure this out until the 1950s. And so, and again, with how clunky the stuff was, it was really difficult to study them in their natural environment and see what they did. Um, I included this little video. Um, take a look at this. So looking around with a regular flashlight at night, trying to find scorpions. Um, black light, I never would have seen this guy. Black light, they glow nicely and honestly the trees of them. Um, we can talk more about that if anyone has questions later. But I think it is absolutely stunning to be out in the desert. You don't want to check around your cot at night or your tent, but as soon as you shine a black light, you can see that. Okay. Um, and just an idea to give you some reference this is the giant hairy scorpion. This is one of those Arizona. Uh, bark scorpions. I scaled them down to the right size with a quarter. Um, which one, right? If you didn't know this guy was potentially fatal, I would have been like, oh, that's the one to play with if you're going to go play with one out in the field. The reality is one general trick is if you see a scorpion that has really big, thick claws, Generally, those claws are helping make up for the fact that they don't have a ton of venom and they aren't very poisonous. Whereas the ones that have these kind of delicate thin claws generally tend to have more venom. I will say I've been stung by scorpions more than once and it's basically a bee sting. You know, it's, it hurts, but it's never enough to stop you from doing your research or staying in the field. Um, anyone want to guess how you pick up a scorpion? <laughs> yeah, besides carefully. Yeah, by the tail. It feels like the, the worst thing on earth to do, but yeah, that's the only way you can avoid getting hurt by them. All right, so, and I wanted to show you guys a picture of this female. Um, so she's got, see all the little babies that look basically identical to her on her back. So kind of a nice mom, right? She, she, when she gives birth, she grabs them with her claw and places them on her back and they stay there. These ones were just about ready to leave. Uh, they were brought to me by uh, a little girl who lived uh, in the house next to our field station. She found it in her dress when she went to put her dress on and she was like, oh, I know those weird gringos would probably want to see this. So she brought it over to me. Um, so it seems kind of cool, like maybe mom of the year in a way. Not really, though, um, because when it's time for them to leave the house, she can and will eat them. Um, scorpions, actually, I said that they don't eat that often. When they do eat, roughly, I, I've seen various numbers, but it's around 20 to 30 percent of what they eat is other scorpions. Um, and in fact, when they're mating, generally the, the males um, not, they don't generally get eaten. They make it about two thirds of the time they survive, and about a third of the time she uh, she eats him after she's gone. So um, maybe not mom of the year, but at least <laughs> sure, it's gonna be. yeah, exactly. A fascinating animal, nonetheless. All right, let me talk about a study that I took part in down in Valle de los Angeles in Baja California. Um, 
Let me back off a little by talking about some, just barely, about some of the research I've done. So I have done some work with some of our undergrads and actually with Paul Dayton and so a bunch of my Mexican colleagues in the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve in northern Sonora, Mexico. Um, I Most of my work has been down here in Valle de los Angeles, um, which is like where that place that Gary Polis is working that I've been at since 2000. Um, and then I've done a little bit of work sort of related to that down in the Midriff Islands, they're called these little islands farther south. Um, let's see. So let me come back to the big scale. I'm going to kind of zoom in a bit. Well, on my program, you would actually zoom in. So I can't blame my, my bad talk on the program, but I can blame the slides. So this is a close up of the midriff area. That right there is Valle de los Angeles. So you can see it is a beautiful little island, set of islands. There are, depending on what you're willing to call an island, 15 or 16 islands in there that we sample each of every summer, looking basically and broadly at these islands are these crazy deserts with no plants growing on them, or very few plants growing on them, how do things even live there? And the answer is, in part, a lot of it is by stuff that washes up on shore. So a lot of it, I get to go back to being an oceanographer and thinking about marine stuff that affects the desert. This island is called the biggest island in Valle de los Angeles. It's called uh, Coronado. Let me bring us up a little bit closer to that one. And on Coronado, one of the beaches we studied. Let's take a look at that. So we have this system. You can see from this aerial photo, there is not much in the way of plants there. These are actually tiny little barrel cactus. And then those are fake plants that I put on to kind of illustrate my point in here. Let me, before we go any further with that, let me introduce you to these, the study animals from this. Um, so on these islands, many of them, we have a couple of different mice. And that's it, which is great for a guy who's not a mice person, because it's pretty easy to tell them apart. So we have pocket mice. Um, these guys are, in the world of mice, pretty big. They get up to about an ounce. And I say there that they're granivorous. That means they mostly eat seeds. Um, I would say in a normal system uh, in the desert, who do you think is the biggest competitor for these guys? They want to hazard a guess. That's a good guess. But actually ants, um, a lot they, because they both want their seeds so badly. So there's your pocket mouse. There are also deer mice, paramiscus out there. Considerably smaller, about 60% the size of a pocket mouse. They're a little different in that they are omnivorous. So they will eat, they like seeds perfectly fine, but they will also eat little isopods. They'll go into the intertidal and eat things in the intertidal. So they aren't as quite as efficient with eating seeds. They'll do it, but they eat a little bit of everything. All right. For the next diagrams, I'm going to use these. So that was supposed to be a pocket mouse. I accidentally while editing it, cut off its tail, so now it just looks like a guinea pig, but <laughs> pretend it's a pocket mouse. Um, I can't blame the program for that. That's totally me. Um, and we're going to call these ones deer mice, and we're going to jump into going back to this system, and let me talk a little bit more about what we found from repeated sampling over a few years down in this area. Um, let's see. So first, when you sample pretty regularly, what we started to see was, it's not that surprising when you think about it, the pocket mice, they're the ones that like the seeds. So they're staying up there farther away from the shore. The, the deer mice, the paramiscus, they're hanging out near the shore because they're taking advantage of all the food they can eat down there. And if they try and go up here and they get kind of bullied by these guys. So they're like, well, I'm gonna stay away from them. I will say that, Twice in the few years I did this sampling, we got both 
a pocket mouse and a deer mouse in one of the traps together, and the deer mouse did not make it. So pocket mice, as adorable as they are, they can be a little mean. All right. What you'll notice, though, in our so we noticed in our sampling was there is this kind of no man's land right in between them, right, where they are competing with each other. So they kind of have this dividing line. Let's think about um, what happens during when there is a rain event. So we were doing some of the sampling right after an El Nino. You can see I'm populating it with a bunch of more plants because we got a ton of plant growth, a lot of seeds being developed there. And in turn, what ends up happening when that happens is that we start to get reproduction from these pocket mice and they start moving down and sort of shoving these guys down closer to the shore. Not saying these ones are unhappy about it because they can still make a living down there, but this population explodes and in turn, that sort of line between them starts moving closer to the shore. Um, of course, in most years down in Mexico, you just have unrelenting sun, right? So it is not, when it's not an El Nino, you're not getting much rain. Um, what ends up happening is these plants start to go away. The ones that are still there start to dry up. There's a lot fewer seeds. And now these guys are at a competitive advantage because they can take, take all that food from the intertidal area. And so they basically shove these pocket mice up further inland. And so you can watch through the years this boundary between the two species moving back and forth, which is kind of amazing, actually, down there. OK, those are my two stories I was going to tell. Um, I'm going to summarize. And to sort of summarize, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and come back to my concepts. I'm not going to give you equations and very specific things that work across both habitats but I do want to talk a little bit about some of these sort of take home messages. One is, I think it's just kind of a given that a lot of people have some pretty negative feelings about the desert, um, uh, a place of bones, right? I, mean, I guess it's kind of true, but that, that doesn't sound very friendly. Um, and, you know, there are so many people calling it a wasteland. That's something I hear a lot, even from students. And I would say, boy, you look at these areas and um, I, it is super tough to see these desert habitats and not think, wow, oh, that is actually kind of awesome. Yes, you do. One thing that's required is you need to spend some time, which I think is what's great about the desert, being thoughtful, being quiet, and just sort of observing. It really forces you, like a lot of stuff in oceanography, actually, it forces you to stop and think of either creative ways to learn things or just think a lot about how you might observe the system. But it is just an incredibly beautiful place. Um, there is way more diversity um, and fascinating natural history going on in the desert than you would expect. 25% is a reference to the fact that 25% of vertebrate species actually occur in no lesson from you. No, it walked could be away. The, it could be the um, the clicker. No, it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't. No, it was totally me. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, mean, I will say there are some similarities. Um, this is purely based on sort of the physics and geology of it. But right, this is a picture of deep sea sediment. This is a picture from taken from a sand dune. Um, there are a lot of the processes that really are the same across those systems. Um, I think the other thing I would say is just that like, it is an amazing system, sort of a platform for learning and study, right? It is a great place for education and reflection. Here is Paul Dayton again, this time with my daughter on the far left and his grandkids telling them a story. He actually wrote a book, um, you know, on Amazon. It's a kid's book 
to where he pretends he interviewed a desert tortoise who is telling him the tales of what was going on in the desert. So it is a great place to just be. And I know a lot of people think of the desert as forbidding and, you know, look at all the cactus, they're so spiky and painful. Honestly, if you spend enough time out there, I consider it such a welcoming environment. Um, it's a pretty awesome place to be. Rather than do standard acknowledgements, I'm just gonna mention some of my other mentors and heroes, people who I have both learned an amazing amount from and who have taught me so much about appreciating the deserts. Uh, Ezekiel Escura, I don't know if any of you know him, he used to be the director of the Natural History Museum. He's up at UC Riverside right now. Um, he was at uh, INE, the National Institute of Ecology. He ran that for a while down in Mexico. Uh, Sula van der Plank, who is uh, both an amazing person and an amazing scientist. I, she makes me very angry. She's so good at everything. Um, she is now down in Loveto working at Eco Alianza, but she works a lot with um, with myself. She works at the San Diego Natural History Museum. She's here at USD. She has a student um, in our grad program. Francisco Piñero um, from the University of Granada in Spain. He was a postdoc in Gary's lab with me when I first started. That guy knows and loves beetles more than any human on earth, I think. Natalia Rivello, she's at UABC down in Ensenada and does a lot of work on sand dunes. And then uh, Martin Cortez is a panguero, one of the boat drivers down in Valle de Los Angeles, who I worked with since actually before I was even doing research down there. Um, he just passed away a couple years ago, but this guy, he knew everything about the desert. And well, this isn't probably a good example, but like that, um, if you're gonna eat a pelican, you wanna eat the babies because they they taste better. Um, I guess you learn that when you get stranded on islands for a few days, but uh, anyway, amazing guy and also a co-author on one of my papers. So, and with that, I'm actually just going to, I guess, sit with you and we'll answer questions together.